his research innovations in Malaysia. It is our privilege to have you here, sir. I request you to share your, your experiences with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rima, for the kind introductions. So before uh, we're going to start our presentation, I just want to confirm you whether my audio is uh, clear for you or if you yes, have sir. any disturbance. OK, clear. Uh, we thank can, you. Uh, yes. OK, uh, I try to share my uh, slide first. Can you able to see the slides, everyone? Yes, sir. Ms. Rima, can you able to see the slides? Uh, I'm not able to see it, sir. We can see it. Yes, now I can see it. Yes, okay. sir, yes. That's good. That's good. Fine. OK, so can I start now? Sure, sir. OK. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Raghuram uh, for giving an opportunity to share uh, of my knowledge to the uh, fellow therapist and also the budding therapist of uh, Sri Ramachandra Medical University. I also thank uh, uh, Sri Ramachandra Medical University for uh, giving an opportunity and accepting my proposal. So without uh, further ado, so we can enter into the, the topic. So good afternoon, everyone. The topic we're going to be discussed today is uh, like a very unique topic. Uh, it's like a low vision rehabilitations. So we're going to promoting the low vision rehabilitation in uh, more on the OT perspectives. So this is a short profile. Mrs. Rima has then already introduced uh, this and uh, I will have some a few membership uh, related to the different associations in the different part of the uh, world. So today learning objectives, we're going to be learn more about the visual impairment uh, in the concern of an uh, older adults. And we're going to know study about anatomy and physiology of the eyes and various eye disease and what do you mean by refractive errors. Understand how we're going to implement the ICF model and also OTPF occupation therapy practice framework uh, to the low vision rehabilitations and understand the evaluation and intervention process for the low vision rehabilitation. So this is the objective we're going to be achieved at the end of the uh, lecture. So before we go into this one, so I'm going to continue the, the lecture. So if you have any doubts, so please note it down and you can be asked at the end of the, the lectures. So that's why I can able to continue the lecture so without any kind of an, uh, disturbance. So it will be easy for you to understand. So we can have a discussion after the end of the sessions. So first we have to be understand about the prevalence of uh, this blindness and the visual impairment. So according to WHO, globally there will be have 2.2 billion people having the visual impairment or blindness. So in that 1 billion people who are having a visual impairment, which has been getting prevented, it means they will have the correction of the errors and they can get all kinds of uh, treatment implementations related to the visual impairment. But 1 billion people who are having a visual impairment, they are not able to address this refractive errors. So they didn't able to get the uh, appropriate kind of uh, treatment or uh, uh, appropriate uh, types of uh, glasses to correct the visions because they can be classified as a moderate severe visual impairment. So it's like on 1 billion is a huge number. So it is mainly due to there is a lack of uh, awareness about this uh, visual impairment and what kind of an, uh, uh, rehabilitation process can be happen for this 
that type of populations. If you see in that 1 billion, majority of the people who are affected with the visual impairment is over 50 years and above. And sometimes the term uh, low vision has been uh, interchangeably used as a visual impairment. And according to ICD-11 of the current uh, classifications of uh, visual impairment, they remove the term of uh, low vision and they will include the visual impairment. And this visual impairment has been classified into mild, moderate and a severe category. So we have to be know the, the different terminologies which has been used by the ophthalmologist and optometrist because as an occupational therapist, we're going to uh, inter uh, interview with the uh, uh, ophthalmologist or uh, uh, optometrist. So it is important for us to understand about the that terminology. So this, uh, if you know the that terminology, it is easy for you to uh, make an uh, communications and uh, uh, understanding the the treatment process. So for that, we have to be know the the definitions of related to the low visions. So what do you mean by low vision? Low vision is a visual impairment which cannot be corrected by the regular treatment methods. Maybe you can able to give the glasses or you can correct the refractory errors, but still the patient is having some kind of an, uh, difficulty in uh, participating in the daily life activities. So that is called as a low visions. So it is a definition given by the National Eye Institute. Uh, next is uh, you have to understand the definition of the blindness. So here we will be targeting more about the legal blindness because when you say it's a legal blindness, then only the patient can able to get the uh, reimbursement process, which can be provided by the many of the insurance company or by the Medicare companies. So that's why the term legal blindness has been used. So according to the US consulate, the legal blindness is considered as the individual who having the visual acuity of 20 by 200 or worse than that, then they call it as a legal blind. And they also concern about the visual field. If the person having a visual field uh, uh, 20 degree or less than 20 degree also eligible for uh, as an illegal blind and they can go for the getting the reimbursement. So the definition of the blindness, which will be varying from country to country. So if you take in India, still India is also having the visual acuity range of 20 by 200 as a uh, legal blindness. But uh, in India, they will call as an uh, employee blindness or they call as social blindness if a severe severity will be getting an uh, increase. If you concern about the WHO, the legal blindness will be considered as a 20 by 400 and with the visual field of an, a 10 degree or less than 10 degree. So this is the different uh, definitions of the blindness. So next is the color visions. Color vision is the ability. You can able to see the different colors and identifying the colors. If you're having an inability to identifying the color, then it's called as a color blindness. So as I am going fast, are you can able to follow me? Is it okay if I go in this tempo? Is okay? Ms. Rima, can you? Okay, thank you. So next is the definition for uh, low vision rehabilitation, uh, which is given by the ophthalmologist. So it is a service mainly designed to help the people who are having a, a difficulty in the visual field or visual acuity, and they will compensate to do the uh, daily functional activity at the optimum level to live the sufficient and uh, good quality of a lifestyle. So if you see the definition of this low vision rehabilitation, which is more related to our OT philosophy, if you think about our OT philosophy, mainly we have to be targeted about making the, our patient has been functionally independent to the optimum level, and we have to be bring the uh, quality of life for our patients. So the definition of a uh, low vision rehabilitation and uh, OT philosophy has been uh, uh, interrelated together. So the American Occupational Therapy Association says that low vision rehabilitation can be given by the OT in order to uh, enhancing the activities of daily living and to make the patient to be uh, do their uh, participation, health and well-being and maintaining the quality of life, but also the activity they want to do and also they need to do. If you're concerned about the, the sentinental vision, the 100-year celebration of an uh, occupational therapy in uh, uh, USA, they see this uh, low vision rehabilitation is one of the growing practice area for an occupational therapy and they think that uh, low vision rehabilitation is having a scope uh, for an uh, occupational therapy. So this is the classifications of the visual uh, impairment. 
uh, according to ICD-11, so the current uh, classifications. The patient who having uh, visual acuity 20 by 40, until 20 by 40, it means they don't have any kind of vision impairment. But if the visual acuity will be worse, more than 20 by 40 or 2070 is called as a mild vision impairment. 2070 to 2200 is moderate and 2200 to 2400 is like a severe impairment. If it is uh, below the more than uh, 2200, then they can come under the category of blindness. They have different category in the blindness is like uh, mild and moderate and the total blindness are profound blindness. When you say there is no light perception, whether the brain is not receiving any kind of light perceptions, then it's called as a total blindness. So this is the classification. As uh, today's concern, we will be going to be see only related to mild vision, moderate vision, and the severe vision impairment, because this is the category which will be inverted into the uh, low visions. According to the American uh, Occupational Therapy Association and uh, Occupational Therapy Framework, so the two important things we have to be considered is our body function and the body structure. So whatever the area you are working, so you need to be know about the body function and body structure of that particular part. If you are working under the musculoskeletal system or if you are working under the neurological system, it is mandatory for us to know about the structure, the anatomy, and also the physiology of the particular structure. So here we are going to be concerned about the the vision, so it is mandatory for us to have the knowledge related to the anatomy of the eyes and also the physiology of the eyes. So if you see the, the anatomy of the eyes, so we're going to know the, the different parts of the eyes. First one, you're going to be see the cornea, cornea which is the outer layer, and this is the part which will be focusing the object in the environment and it will be uh, transferring the, the informations uh, to the, the lens. So behind the cornea, you can able to see the anterior chamfer. So this anterior chamfer will be filled with uh, the liquid. We call it as aqueous humor. So after the uh, anterior chamfer, you can able to see the iris. So the iris, which is the outer layer structure, which will be surrounding the people. And we have the people. The people is a part which will be allowing the amount of light which can be entered into the, the lens. So the people can able to constrict or dilate. So by means of constrict, it can able to sending the sharp images. By means of dilate, it can sending the the uh, the images which will be not very sharp or blurred session. So these people can able to uh, control the the amount of light which can able to enter into the the lens. So after the people, you can able to see the lens. So where the the light perception of the images has been fall down in the lens, and the lens can be transforming the information straight to the retina. So the retina is the, the part which will be uh, concerning the, the images and the image will be fall on this retina. And from the retina, the image has been converted into the uh, light sensor by means of the, the receptors, uh, we call it as a photoreceptors. This photoreceptors will be carrying this light sensor through the optic nerve and it will be passed through the optic nerve. Then it can be transferring into the uh, visual cortex, which has been presented in the occipital lobe. So the optic nerve is a structure, is responsible for transforming the informations uh, from the eye to the uh, visual cortex. And in the center of the, the eyeball, we have the, the gel-like substance, which is called as a vitreous uh, body, which can be filled with the vitreous humor. And another important structure, which has been presented in the uh, posterior aspect of the eye, we can see is like a macula. So inside the macula, we have the fovea, the deep depression inside the macula, we call it as a fovea. This fovea is responsible for uh, getting the sharp visions. And if you see the cross section of the, the macula, you can see they will have the retina and behind the retina, we have the, uh, the choroid. The choroid is the structure that will supply the uh, blood to the retina and also the nutrition substance to the retina. And after that, we have retinal epithelium cell and which will having this uh, rods and cones and the rods is a structure which will carry the information uh, of the images and the cone which will carry the, the color sensations. So these two photoreceptors will be combined together and taking the information to the, the brain. And we having the sclera, the sclera which will be covering the, the whole eye and it will giving the, the structure of the eyes and to maintaining the, the structure of the eyes. Apart from that, we having the ciliary muscles 
the ciliary muscles which will be holding the lens and help for the constriction and also the dilatations of the lens so whenever you want to focusing the sharp object or we focusing the near or distant objects and we having the eyelids which will protecting the eyes and we have the tear duct which will be producing the tears and it will be removing all the debris which has been presented in the eyes and it will be keep the, the sclera of the eye should be more wet and we already know we have the the muscles six muscles which are surrounding the eyes which will be responsible for the the eye movements we have the lateral rectus muscles and the medial rectus and also anterior and superior uh, oblique muscles also so this is the the anatomy of the eye as an occupational therapist when you're dealing with the low vision rehabilitation so we must to know the the structure of the eyes because any damages uh, causes in this structure then it will be leads to the uh, poor physiological functions and this physiological function will be uh, affecting our uh, activities in the limitations then our activity limitation will be restricting our participation in the doing the activities so it's like go in a hierarchical process so it is mandatory for us to know the, the anatomical structure first so next we have to be understand about the the physiology so maybe a uh, few of the participant here will be an uh, the practitioner and may having uh, many years of an experience so for them it will be like a kind of an uh, ref refreshing the informations but for our uh, uh, budding therapist or the students so it will be a uh, very good informations they have to be understand more about anatomy and physiology first before uh, enter into the any of the the treatment modalities so if you see the the physiology of the eye is comparing to the the functions of the camera so how the camera is function it the, our eyes will also having the same kind of functions first the images which will be fall on the retina then it has been processed in the retina as a, a light sensor receptor then it will carry to the brain by means of an optic nerve then in the brain it will be do the further processing then we having the perception of the images has been set in our brain the same like if you see in a camera the photo detector uh carry the images and it will be stored in the camera memory then it goes to the computer then comes to computer screen and you can able to see the the images so next we're going to see about the the small video uh, regarding the the physiology of the eye in this minute we will learn about visual process the fundamental effect the light has is that it enables us to perceive the world around us. The role of light in our contact with the environment can hardly be overestimated. And this is possible because of an extremely delicate sense organ, the human eye. In fact, more than 80% of the information we receive from the outside world passes through our eyes. Let us understand the visual process. Our eye functions in roughly the same way as a traditional camera with a lens that projects an inverted image of the scene. With a lens that projects an inverted image of the scene onto the light sensitive inner film. In the eye, this film is replaced by the retina and consists of light sensitive nerve mandates. The eyes in front of the lens can open or close, like the diaphragm of a camera, to control the amount of light that enters the eye. The opening in the center of the eyes is called the pupil. When more light is incident on the eye, the pupil size becomes smaller, and again, like in the camera, the depth of focus, or the distance over which we see sharp images, becomes greater. Here, the light is transformed by a photochemical process into an electric current and transmitted through the nerves into the brain that interprets it as visual information. Human eye has the unique properties of sensitivity to one of different body levels and the ability to distinguish between different shades of colors. These properties are obtained through the division of work between millions of highly specialized light sensitive nerve endings, known as cones and rods. The rods are highly light sensitive and are principally responsible for the detection of rough shapes and movement. Cones, on the other hand, are less sensitive to light, but can distinguish colors. In case of low lighting level, vision is by rods only. 
Some fruits of rubber connect to a common nerve fiber that goes into the brain. However, because of this grouping, the exact position of the light source is not known, resulting in a rather blurry vision. At higher lighting levels, the cones take over completely. Each individual cone, unlike balance, connects to the brain by a single nerve fiber. Visual acuity, or resolving power with cone vision, is therefore far better, resulting in sharper images. Now let us understand the adjustment mechanisms of the eye. The first mechanism is accommodation. Focusing at different distances is achieved by changing the refracting power or focal length of the lens. The lens of the eye can contract under muscular control, making it more convex, thus shortening the focal length. This process is called accommodation. The second mechanism we will learn is convergence. We use both eyes to look at one and the same target. To achieve this, we unconsciously rotate our eyes in our eye sockets. We call this convergence. When we look at an object, the lines of sight of the two eyes will intersect at the target point. The closer the object, the greater is the inward rotation of the eye. The required amount of rotation is a measure of the object distance as noted by our brain. Thank you. Okay, so the video has been uh, clearly explained to you about uh, what is a physiological function and uh, we need the accommodations and also the convergence property in order to bring the object nearer and also far away to get the sharp images. And next we have to be understand about the, the visual pathway. So where the information has been carried from the eye, it goes to the brain. So if you see the, the physiology of this visual pathway, so we have a two fibers which is called as a nasal fiber and temporal fiber in the eye. So if you see the, the right uh, nasal fibers and also the left temporal fiber, which will be bringing the right visual field and uh, the right the temporal fiber and the left nasal fiber will bring in the uh, left visual field. And this information has been carrying through the optic tract and it has been getting intersected in the optic chiasma. Then the right visual field, which will be goes to the left part of the brain and the left visual field will be go to the uh, right part of the brain. So after it uh, getting uh, crossed in the optic chiasma, then it has been entered into the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is present in the thalamus. And from the lateral geniculate nucleus, it has been goes into the uh, uh, visual cortex, uh, which by means of an optic radiations. So there will be some intersection function is happening from the lateral geniculate body. Some of the information is will go to the uh, superior colicus, which is present in the midbrain. And here the information like the movement of the eyes and the object tracking has been getting maintained. And then the information has been sent back to the pulmonary nuclei, which has been presented in the thalamus. So we have to be understand about this uh, process of uh, visual pathway, because if there is uh, any damages uh, happen in the structure of the eye, then it will have some uh, uh, visual acuity, visual field problems. If there is any damages which has happened after the eyes, and maybe in the optic tract, or maybe in the subcortical structure, or maybe in the cortical structure, then it may lead to get some <clears throat> visual field deficit or visual perception problems, which will be most commonly get uh, when it is after the eye structures. So. In order to understand the, the pathology, we have to know the very good anatomy and also the physiology of the particular structures. So next we move on to the different components which has been considered in the visions. So one of the main component is like in visual acuities. Uh, it is the level of detail what the person can able to see uh, in the environment from the particular distance. Uh, next is the refractions. It is the evaluation of an optical system, whether you are getting the, the image of that particular uh, refraction of the particular image is exactly on your retina or not. Uh, next is the visual field. It is the total area one you're going to be see in a single view uh, by keeping the head in the center point without turning the head and turning the eyes. So that's called as in visual field. Uh, next is the contrast sensitivity. It is an ability to distinguish the different shades uh, like a light color and the dark contrast, which has been present in the similar colors. For example, if they're giving like a blue and blue, you can able to uh, see the, the difference between the 
the blue and blue so if you have this ability then your contrast sensitivity is good suppose you having a difficulty in uh, differentiating this uh, two uh, type of uh, colors or the two type of uh, contrastivity then it the, it means that you having some contrast sensitivity problems and next is we going to see the light modulation so light modulation is the ability to adapt to changing the light conditions uh, for example you will be entering uh, in your house after uh, in the bright sunlight you enter into the house so there will be a sudden uh, changing in the light so you uh, you will can see there will be some kind of a uh, darkness or glaring situation when you enter into the different types of uh, light uh, your eye will take some time for getting into the accommodation to the particular uh, environment suppose uh, suddenly the current will be off and you enter into the darkness you cannot able to see the environment immediately but after a few minutes you can able to see the object uh, even in the darkness so your eye will be able to modulating the uh, the light so this call as a light modulation so this five component we going to see in the detail so first is then visual acuity the normal visual acuity is 20 by 20 so as per the classification of an icd 11 that mean the person can uh, ability to see the the small object uh, small details in the object uh, from the particular distance so if you see the client who having a 20 by 100 visual acuity so it means that he will having the five times relatively less acuity when compared to the the normal uh, person so if you see what is that 20 by 20 means the first 20 which will be mainly dealing about the the distance the 20 meter distance you can able to read the the letter size which will having a, a 20 so letter size is 20 that means you can able to read the the small letter from the 20 meter distance that means your normal visual acuity if you can able to read only the the letter size of 100 when you are seeing from the 20 meter distance that means automatically you will be five times less acuity you are having so if the person can able to read the letter only 100 from 20 meter distance that means they cannot able to read the letters below like 80 50 uh, 20 like that but they can able to read the letter above the 100 is like uh, 150 200 or 300 they can able to read the letter but below 100 they cannot able to read so this we call it as a uh, low vision so as an ot we have to be understand about what is mean by this denominations like 20 100 or 20 200 we can able to understand then it's easy for us to uh, giving the treatment for our patient so we can able to keep the uh, distance of the treatment object within this particular visual acuity where the patient can able to see it so for that purpose so understanding about this denomination is very important for an occupation therapist so usually we will use the slanan chart uh for uh, checking the visual acuity but in the case of an uh, low vision it is difficult to use a slanan chart because if you see the slanan chart it will can able to detect the visual acuity up to 20 by 200 but the low vision person sometimes they will have a, a 20 by 400 2700 or 20000 it will be differ so we cannot able to use the slanan chart and that particular time so we have the different types of an visual acuity chart for especially used in the uh, low vision client and vision uh, acuity can able to measured in the two types one is on the distance acuity uh, and another one is by the near visual acuity so if you see the slanan chart is mainly uh, based on the the distance acuity so this is a slanan chart <clears throat> you can see the uh, 20 by 20 letters it is very small the person can able to read the letter from the 20 meter distance and if the person can able to read this then it's normal acuity suppose the person can able to read only uh, uh, level the meter 3 of uh, toz that mean he having visual acuity of 20 by 70 so it's like an low vision and if a person can able to read only the big letter e that means uh, his visual acuity is uh, 20 by 200 so that mean person is having low vision uh, and also the mild and moderate categories so we can able to detect the visual acuity by keep the person to reading this the letter from the 20 meter distance for the low vision categories so we having the uh, faint blown uh, visual acuity chart because the visual this chart will be measuring the the visual acuity ranging from 20 by 1000 to 20 by 20 for the normal so you can able to see the the big letter the person can able to see only this kind of big letter so it will come under 20 by 1000 and you can having the various uh, letter denomination with the different sizes so if the person can able to read this small one is normal and it will be 
like a 963 it will be like having a low vision so we can able to use this uh, fin blend chart uh, for the person who having a low vision to measuring the uh, distant visual acuity and the chronister uh, packet uh, acuity chart this can also used for the the low vision categories uh, and it also also having the same kind of a numbers the person can able to read from the the different distance uh, the main important thing is they can able to uh, read from the uh, 20 meter distance as it is uh, same for the solenoid chart but if the person having difficulty in doing that you can able to reduce the uh, the distance instead of 20 meter you can reduce to 10 meter but the thing is you have to be double the the visual acuity for an example if he is having a 20 by 70 in 20 meter and you have difficulty in reading that so you can able to decrease the distance to 10 meter but we have to be double the, the visual acuity. That means he will have 20 by 140. So you can able to double because we are reducing the, the distance. So that is one of the facilities can available by using this uh, chronister packet acute uh, chart. And uh, one of another advantage of using this chart is you can able to carry this chart anywhere because it's a packet size. You can put in your uh, code packet and you can take it whenever you want to measuring the, the visual acuity, you can able to use it. But uh, the flammeton chart is like uh, the big chart, sometimes it will be difficult for you to carry. And you can use this uh, uh, chronister uh, packet acuity chart both for adult and also the uh, children's. So the two acu low vision acuity we see before is uh, based on the, the distance one. But this M and read chart, which will be measuring the, the near visual acuity. And uh, it is also measuring the reading ability of the, the person. So one of the difference between the other chart and this uh, MN read chart is, so it's not only asking the person to just to read the letter, it will ask the person to read the sentence or reading the paragraph. Because if you see in uh, our daily day-to-day -day activities, uh, just reading a letter is not be any more uh, functional. Uh, reading a statement or reading a paragraph is like uh, think like a more uh, functional for example if you want to read a newspaper you should have some uh, good reading ability task then it will be easy for you so for that purpose this mn read chart has been uh, mentioned and uh, in the practice guideline for an american occupation therapy association you can able to use this mn read chart in order to identify the uh, near visual acuity and also the the reading ability of the person and this is also having a normal from 20 by 20 up to the 20 by 400. You can able to see it here. And you can ask a person to read the sentence. If the person is having difficulty in reading the normal visual acuity, you can just gradually ask them to read the letter where they can able to see it very clearly and they can able to read. Suppose the person can able to read only this big letter like, my father take me to the school for every day in his big uh, green car. Then the patient has difficulty in this one. So you can able to mention his visual acuity is like a 20 by 400. And you can also use the timer when the person start to reading. So to check uh, how speed he can able to read the, uh, the particular sentences. So you can able to use this MN chart as a pre and post test after you giving uh, the rehabilitation process to identify whether the reading abilities uh, has been getting uh, improved or not for the, the person. So this MN chart can be most widely used for an uh, occupational therapist for the near vision uh, acuity. So these are the different types of visual acuity charts. So next we have to deal about the refractions. So refraction is the image you're going to be uh, see uh, without any problems. So that means your uh, refraction is normal that we call it as an uh, uh, emetrophia. Emetrophia means a uh, normal uh, refraction. You doesn't have any kind of a problem in viewing the object. If you have any problem in this refraction, then we call it as a refractive error. So there are different types of refractive errors. We have myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. So myopia is called as a near uh, sightedness. So that means the person can able to see the, the near object, but they will have a difficulty in seeing the, the distance objects. So that's called as a uh, uh, myopia nearsightedness so what will happen here the image the, the focal point which will be falling in front of the retina so actually the focal point has to be fall on the retina then the retina can be processed to the optic nerve but here the image of the the focal point of the image has been falling just in front of the retina so the person cannot able to see the object which is uh, on the, the distance so when it, they bring the object very nearer then they can able to see it 
Uh, next is the uh, hyperopia is like a far sightedness. Here the person can able to see the object in, in the distances, but uh, they cannot able to see the object in very near. Uh, they will have kind of an uh, blurred vision because you can see the focal point which is falling far behind the retina. So it will be go beyond the retina, so it will not able to catch the, the images clearly. So that call as a far sightedness or hyperopia. Astigmatism is like the focal point of the images, which has been fought in the different areas. It's not only straighted on the retina, it may be fallen on the other aspect of retina. So the person cannot able to see the sharp images, like one single point images. They can able to see the images like very big and blurred, and they cannot able to see the, the uh, particular details of the, uh, the images. So that's called as a astigmatism. That means they are having the irregular visions or blurred visions. So this is mainly happen because the the eyeball is losing its shape or the cornea will be lost its shapes. So the cornea cannot be able to focus images. Do you remember I mentioned in the anatomy the cornea is a structure which will be uh, focusing the images. So because the shape of the cornea is getting changed, so it cannot be able to take the images appropriately and to give it to the, the retina. So this is called as a astigmatism, And the next one is like a presbyospia. Presbyospia is mainly happen uh, due to the age related factors because uh, when you're getting older, the flexibility of the lens has been getting affected. So for example, if you want to see some uh, object in a very sharp manner, you will be try to constricting your people and you can focusing on the object or you want to concentrate more. So this kind of an accommodation changes are happening in the lens, but due to the age related process, the lens will be affecting his flexibility. So what happened is like uh, the images will be fall far behind the, uh, the retina. So they cannot able to see the image correctly. And this can be usually corrected by using the uh, glasses, which can be prescribed by the optometrist. And here I will give you the, some of the information about how to correct the uh, hyperopia. Hyperopia, you know that the retinal images will be, the image will be falling behind the retina. So we need to be bring the, the images uh, back into the retina. So usually we using the uh, convex kind of a lens because the convex kind of lens, which will be giving more convergent factors. So it will bring the images back into the retina. And you can uh, use the concave lens in order to correcting the, uh, the factor of the nearsightedness where the images will be falling in front of the retina by using this kind of lenses. So we can able to bring the uh, images go back to the retina by means of uh, creating more divergent uh, factors and it will be goes back to the retina level. So this is the different types of uh, refractive errors. So this is an epidemiological study which is done on the press biosphere. So due to the age factors. So this will be giving an incidence that uh, more than 70%, I just concentrated on India, you can see that more than 70% of the population in India is having this uh, press biosphere. And sometimes they will not having the awareness to correcting the, this kind of an refractive errors. But if you see in uh, other developed countries like US, Canada and Australia, New Zealand, you can able to see they have only a, a less amount of the population who having this one because their vision already getting evaluated and most of the population is getting corrected visions. So <clears throat> basically what we have to know is like, there is a lack of awareness among the patients uh, and also <clears throat> among the other uh, professionals in order to creating the awareness to the people to get corrected their refractive error visions. So next is the <clears throat> visual field. So visual field is uh, individual can see the, the visual world in a straight headed point of uh, fixations. And here we having the normal visual field. If you see in the more vertical aspect in superiorly, you having 60 degree, inferiorly you have 75 degree. And for uh, laterally is 100 and medially is like 60. So the total, the horizontal uh, vision ability is like 160 and this uh, the vertical vision ability is uh, 135. <coughs> so this is the normal visual field limits. If the person is having any uh, field loss, uh, like uh, less than 20 degree, then they will need the, the visual rehabilitations. 
because uh, it comes under the definition of blindness if your visual field is uh, 20 degree or less than 20 degree then definitely you need a uh, visual rehabilitation as in the ot part ot part we will be morely concerned on the uh, two types of an visual field uh, one is uh, peripheral visual field and another is a central visual field so we going to see what is this peripheral visual field and central visual field so you can see here <clears throat> the central visual field loss so especially you will have difficulty in see the the details of the images which has been presented in the center aspect but you can able to see the images on the the peripheral side but you cannot able to see the images on the the center part so we call it as the scotoma it which will be affecting the central part of your vision and this type of an visual field the central visual field loss mainly you can see in the age related uh, macular degenerations so next is the peripheral visual loss where you can can able to see the central visual field but your peripheral area will be getting affected so this we call it as a tunnel vision so you can able to see only the the particular part of the images so the peripheral area will be affected this type of an vision loss can be usually seen in the conditions like a glaucoma and this type of an peripheral visual loss will be leads to get a lot of an motor vehicle accident because uh, sometimes the people will not uh, notice this kind of an error they will be doing their day to day life activities sometimes they will not able to see the full images of the road so they can more related to get into the accident so next is the visual field cut so mainly uh, caused due to the any of the neurological uh, damages like uh, cerebrovascular accident or uh, traumatic brain injury or parkinson or multiple sclerosis so example what we have given here is a home and immersive myonophia you can see the person cannot able to see the the total left side uh, of the vision she can able to see only on the right side so you will have a total left visual uh, field has been cut so these are the uh, different types of visual field and as an ot we must to be consider about the different types of visual field how to correct this problems so next is a contrast sensitivity so this is one of the strong area where uh, ot has to be concerned because the contrast sensitivity will be strongly associated with the uh, many of our uh, daily life activities like uh, reading performance mobility is driving uh, recognizing the face especially for the communications because you cannot able to identifying the emotional uh, reactions which has been shown on the face if you don't have a good kind of an vision or ability to distinguish the different parts of the faces and also having difficulty in doing uh, ideal activity so that's why contrast sensitivity is very important uh, to assess by an occupation therapist when you want to do uh, any kind of an uh, environmental modifications or changes uh, we have to be think about the contrast sensitivity so the contrast sensitivity means the person can able to see an object even at the lower contrast so for example the normal person even it is a low contrast i can able to see the the images for example you can see in the low contrast i can even see some kind of a small dotted structures even the contrast is less so it means that my contrast level is good maybe i can my detect my contrast level is 25 if it is like 1 or 2 i cannot able to see it but maybe 10 or 20 i can able to see the the images so it will be determining my contrast sensitivity so the ability to see the the lower level of an uh, contrast sensitivity we call it as a contrast threshold so how much of a lower contrast level you can able to see an object so that is your contrast threshold so it is important for us to assess the contrast threshold of the client and based on that you can able to do the modifications so next another term we have to be understand is about the contrast reserve here is a difference between the contrast of the object and also the the client contrast uh, threshold for example my contrast uh, threshold is 50 and the object contrast is only 25 means that mean i will have a difference of a uh, 25 contrast level so i cannot able to see the object Uh, is like a 40 30 or 20 so if my contrast level is 50 definitely you have to do the modification of the environment make the contrast level is more than 50 for the client it should not be less than 50 for the client if it is less than 50 then the person cannot able to get all the images in the uh, environment so that's why it is very important we have to be understand about the contrast threshold and what is contrast reverse and we have to check with our client when you are doing the modification for our persons so if the contrast uh, level of object is less the person has to be 
increasing the contrast level so we need to be increasing contrast sensitivity of the person if the object contrast is more then we no need to have increasing the contrast sensitivity it will be decreased so it is like a, a reverse inverse will be inversely reversible to each others so that's why contrast sensitivity is very very important for occupational therapists to know about it and here they giving you the some of the common objects uh, which having the normal contrast for example if you have an a uh, maroon chair with an a uh, maroon carpet so it is very difficult to differentiate so you can see the contrast percentage is only 5 so it is very difficult for the person to differentiate the carpet and the maroon chair the same thing you can keep the maroon chair and the gray carpet so it will have a good contrast so you can see the level of contrast is like a 74 so patient not having any kind of a difficulty so like that we have a, a different uh, object with a different contrast level maybe you can see the us currency the contrast level is like 55 to 60 maybe i think the indian currency which we are using now we having a different colors of color very very high contrast color so it will be easy for the low vision people to identify we have a pink color green color so we have a different kind of colors so easy for the low vision people to identify it so next is a light modulations so our environment will be fully covered with the lights and uh, we need to see whether the patient's environment will have an appropriate uh, light if the person environment doesn't have an appropriate light definitely it will be affecting their daily life activities so it is mandatory for an occupational therapist to assess the the light uh, in the environment uh, to check the how much of an luminance has been presented in that particular working area for example uh, taking a student who do some reading activity whether in the particular space will have the appropriate light or not maybe you can using the the lux meter in order to measuring the the luminance level and you can ask the person whether they have any difficulty in that particular space uh, in the reading or whether they will be satisfied with the light or not so if the person is not satisfied you can changing the the watts of the the bulb and you can check with the person after changing the light whether they will have the satisfaction and the performance level is getting increased so we can able to uh, do some uh, modifications and checking the pre and post level so by means of this you will helping the patient so this is the light modulations sometime when you are driving you can able to see the the glaring of the sunlight if you are normal accommodation then is no problem for people who having a low vision which has been unnoticed and they cannot able to tolerate this kind of an glare and uh, uh, things so they may get into an accident because they cannot able to control the glare so if you want to control the glare maybe you can go with uh, optical devices like a uh, uv light rays uh, spectacle can able to use and also we need to be correcting our working space environment with appropriate light level so as an ot the light modulation is also very important so when you do the modification for the patient so next we have to check whether a patient is having the binocularity binocularity means the ability of using the two vision uh, two eyes to focusing on the the particular object sometimes the person is having difficulty in this kind of an binocularity so we have a two different types of an condition one is uh, amplopia amplopia the person cannot able to having the clear visual acuity on the both eye maybe they will have the uh, good visual acuity on one eye and another eye they doesn't have the very clear visions so we sometimes we call uh, this as a lazy eye one eye is not uh, very focusing on the particular object so definitely this will be affecting the, the occupational performance of the patient especially in reading writing or uh, doing some kind of an uh, functional activities so we need to be check whether the patient is having any kind of an amyoglobia or not so next is the strabismus so the strabismus you can see inability to focusing on the object so the eyes both eyes will not be at the same places so this is mainly due to the uh, weakness of the the eye muscles the rectus muscles so maybe leads to this problem so either the eye one eye will be in the up or down or it may be inward or outward suppose if it is go like a more inward we call it as like uh, estrophia if you going more outward we call it as extrophia and is going upward is called hypertrophia and downward is, is like uh, hypotrophia so what will happen if the person is having this kind of entrabismus because uh, sometimes they will have like uh, double visions they cannot able to see the object very clearly so they can have the double vision and the inability to carrying the detail all the details of the objects 
So that are the different concept of the visions. So we have to be understand about it. And when you are evaluating your patient, we have to be look all the, uh, the vision concept. So common eye diseases, uh, which has been involved in the low visions. We have age related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, cataracts, which is most commonly seen nowadays, and the retinitis uh, pigmentosa and the neurological uh, diseases. So what is the age related uh, macular degenerations? So it will happen uh, for the el elderly populations. Mainly the problem which will become in this uh, AMD is like a central vision loss. We already see the central visual field has been getting affected for the patient. So you can see the images here, the central visual field is getting affected, but the peripheral can be seen, but it's still like more uh, blurry kind of visions. Uh, there are two different types of uh, macular degeneration. One is dry, another one is a wet. So what will happen physiologically means the retinal ep uh, pigment epithelium is getting affected uh, due to the degeneration process. And you can see the most of the AMD will be start with the, the dry AMD and then the progressive, the more damages happen to the, the retinal layer can be leads to the uh, wet uh, macular degenerations. So the, what is a dry macular degeneration it means you can see a lot of uh, debris. So the dust or dust material you can see, and sometimes there will be some uh, scarring on the macular region can able to see. So it will be affecting the, the view of the, the central point of the eye. And the wet AMD is like, uh, they will have a cluster of the blood vessel which will under the, uh, the macula. So you can able to see there is a lot of uh, cluster of blood vessel has been there. So the focal point of the images cannot able to travel to the retina. So the patient cannot able to see the, the images, especially on the center point of the, the visions. So that is called as an age-related macular degeneration. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yes. uh, some people are not able to see the screen, uh, the presenting screen. So is it possible for you to restart it? Because someone else uh, presented the their screen. So I think some people lost it. OK, so I will be start again. Uh, yes, sir. I stop sharing and then start sharing, right? Yeah, from this slide onwards, sir. Okay. Sorry, sir. No problem, no problem. Please. I request everyone not to press the press and now button please uh, is it visible now yeah, yes yes uh, uh, so let me button? yeah let me confirm is it visible for everyone please comment on the chat Okay, so yes, it is. Okay, possible. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we will continue. So we seen about the AMD. Then next we're going to see about the uh, diabetic retinopathy. So the name itself, you know, it has been causes due to the, the diabetes mellitus. So the diabetes will be affecting a lot of uh, small blood vessels. Uh, uh, it will be affecting overall the body parts. Eye is also getting affected because it's not only sparing eye also, the eye is now so affected. So the diabetic retinopathy, we having a, a different uh, visual problem, which can be ranging from the floaters to the uh, total blindness. So you can see the images in the, the right side corner on the top of the right wrist corner. You can see the images. The, you can see the images with a lot of uh, floaters. Uh, floater is uh, nothing but uh, sometime when you close and open your eyes, you can see like the warm light structure which will be flowing in front of your eyes. So that's called as a floater. So this type of a floater which will be affecting the the images which can be uh, falling on the retina. So you can see there is a small small dot like structures. You cannot able to see the images very clearly. So you'll have like a more blurred kind of envisions. If it, it can be in the starting stages, but uh, if the uh, 
the disease is getting uh, progress, then it may lead to get some kind of a uh, total blindness. So we can divide the diabetic retinopathy into two types, it's called as a non-proliferative and also the uh, proliferative uh, type. So in the non-proliferative type, it can be divided as a mild, moderate, and severe category. So initially, you can see in the, there will be a lot of uh, small uh, cotton wool spots, or they maybe have like a small, small uh, hemorrhages are happening inside the eyes. So because of that, you can able to see the images like this. Uh, but in the proliferative diabetic neuropathy, it is like more advanced stage. If your diabetic is like a very version, so we, it will like, cause the more damages to the eye. So you can see the lot of uh, neovascularization, which can be seen in the more uh, 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 proliferative stages. So you can see the macula, which has been uh, totally getting affected. So the person cannot able to see the, the vision so properly. So it is mandatory uh, for the OT when you dealing with a patient with a diabetics uh, in order to taking the, the medications and uh, putting the insulin, you know, the different types of diabetes like uh, insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent. So make sure they will be taking their medications properly and also ask them to go for the repeated uh, eye checkups uh, to the optometrist or ophthalmologist in order to uh, in line with the, the vision uh, abilities. So it is uh, one of the important uh, role of an OT to educate the patients about whether they for, do the follow-up properly or not. So next is the glaucoma. So the pressure inside the eyes will be getting increased. So this will be causing the the compression of the optic nerve, sometimes if it is in a very severe conditions, the compression of the optic nerve will be causing more uh, total blindness for the patients. So here what will be happening means they will have a lot of an, uh, loss of an, the peripheral visions. So you can see they will have a lot of uh, the peripheral visions field has been getting affected. Only they can able to see the, the central visual point. So this glaucoma can be able to treat with a lot of uh, eye drops or uh, with a surgery, so it can be treatable. So if the person has been uh, having uh, this kind of pressure, usually they will check the, the pressure when you go for a regular eye checkup, so they will be checking the, the pressure of the eyes also. And it must be treated before it damaging the optic nerve. So if the optic nerve is getting damaged and it is difficult to recovering back in the information uh, goes to the optic nerve because it will fall under the interior aspect of the eye and difficult to cause uh, treating the problems. Uh, next is a cataract. So it is a very common uh, uh, condition we can see nowadays. So many people are visiting the eye hospital mainly because of this uh, cataract problems. So cataract is, is nothing but there is a clouding of the, the crystalline lens which has been present in our eyes. So this cataract surgery is most common. If it is uh, left untreated, so it will be causing some uh, dull color or blur visions. So the client who having the cataract, so basically they will have a decreased contrast sensitivity. They have difficulty in uh, identifying the difference in the contrast of the color. And they may also more prone to getting the motor vehicle accidents. So that is uh, very important. So, and one of the thing here is the, person who developing the contract, uh, cataracts cannot able to see the problem initial. So this uh, cataract is not comes in a one or two day. It will be like a slow progressing conditions. So it will take some time. So the cataract can be started slowly and then it will be covering the whole lens or maybe it's covering the part of the lens. Then only covering the part of the lens, half part of the lens, then the person can able to see the difficulty in uh, seeing the environment and uh, they will be uh, go for consulting the uh, ophthalmologist. So next is the retinitis uh, pigmentosa. It is a progressive hereditary eye diseases, which are also causing some damages to the retinal cell. So mainly you can see people will be start noticing the problem only when they're having the night blindness. So it will not uh, seen uh, before. Only they start facing the night blindness and they start losing the peripheral vision. Then they can go for the, the consultation with the doctors. And it is like more progressive in nature. So initially they will having a central vision is spared. So they will have the uh, peripheral visual loss. Uh, the central vision will be there. But when the condition is getting uh, more uh, progressive, so the central vision is also getting more strength and they can just see only like a pinhole size uh, of the images. And this retinous pigmentosa may even cause some total blindness for the patients. 
So neurological diagnosis, mainly the optic nerve is getting damages. So you will having a visual field loss. So some conditions like glaucoma, stroke, or multiple sclerosis. So another important thing we have to be know about the, the physics of the, the optics of the lenses, because uh, uh, when the optometrist is uh, suggesting the low vision devices for our patients, and we have to be check, evaluate the devices, whether it will be uh, useful for the patients in doing all the uh, daily function activities. And if you find uh, there is any difficulty for the patient in using this kind of an uh, optical devices, you can also uh, recommend the, uh, the patient to go for a selection of the different uh, devices or you can go for suggesting the ophthalmologist or optometrist to uh, talk about the, the client problem, how he facing the problem in using the devices. And you can suggest them uh, good optical devices which can be used in a various daily life activities. So optical device is very important uh, role in the uh, low vision rehabilitation. So as an OT, we have to be know about the different optical devices and uh, its functions, how it can able to work. And uh, we, we have a great role in uh, teaching uh, how to use this uh, optical devices in the daily uh, activities. So for that, we need to know about the physics of the lens. So you can see the, the convex lens, which will be uh, more focusing about the conversion activities and uh, concave lens, which can be more go for the property of an, uh, a divergent property. So if the person is having a far sight net problem, you can usually give the convex lens to bring the convergence. And those who are having near sightedness will be go for the divergent to bring the images back into the retina. There are different types of lens. And uh, convex lens, we always call as a plus lens. And the concave lens, we call it as a minus lens. Maybe when the optometrist is uh, suggesting the, the glass or the lens for you, you can see the sign. They will put the plus signs. So it means that they will be providing the convex lens. And if they're putting a minus signs, it will be providing the, the concave lens. So mainly, they will use it for farsightedness. And concave is mainly for the nearsightedness. And they will have a cylindrical lens, which can be given for the astigmatism people who are having the blurred kind of conditions. And other terminologies which can be used in optics, like accommodations. Uh, accommodation means any of the refractive error corrected by the eye glasses, that means called as an accommodations. And you should be know how they were calculating the, the power of the lens. Usually they will be measure the uh, lens power by means of an adapter. And this is the formula for uh, uh, checking the power of lens. And next very important thing the OT has to be understand is about the focal distance, or you call it as a focal length. Uh, this is the distance, the lens to bring some parallel rays to for the sharp focus. So maybe, what may be the appropriate uh, distance level the person can able to see the images in a more uh, clear way. So that is called as a focal length. So usually this is the formula to measuring the focal length. So how much of an adapter you are using, for example, if you are using one, two, three, or four. So according to that, your focal distance will be getting changed. It is very critical for occupation therapists to design the distance of holding the optical devices uh, during uh, activities like reading and writing tasks. So next is the magnification. You will use a lot of a magnifier. So the characters of magnifier can be mentioned in the devices like uh, 5x or 10x. So it will be mentioning that how much of a magnification can able to done with that particular kind of an, uh, devices. And uh, another important thing we have to be know is like a method of magnifications. We can divide the method of magnification is like a relative size magnifications. It is mean that you are not doing any changes in the eye of the person or you are not giving any kind of an, uh, uh, lens changes in the eyes. We can just uh, changing the size of the object. In city, for example, if it is a small letter for the person uh, uh, difficult to read, you can just increasing the size of the, the letter. So if you're just making a size will be bigger, so the person will not having any problem. So that is called as the size magnifications. So next one is like uh, relative distance magnifications. This patient is not able to read the small letter. So instead of changing the size, you can able to bring the object very nearer to the, the person. So when you bring the object very nearer to the person, automatically they will having the, the magnification. So that is called as a distance magnification. And this distance magnification is can mainly done by uh, the lenses magnifier, what we've seen before. We can use the different kinds of magnifier. You can able to adapt this one. 
So that means you will be uh, stationary and the object will be moving closer to you or the object will be stationary and you will be moving closer to the object. So next magnification is by means of uh, projections. You can use a lot of electronic devices like uh, CCTV or uh, you can have a lot of uh, OHP devices you can able to use to magnifying. Nowadays we have a lot of uh, uh, iPad or uh, iPhone will have all this uh, uh, electronic devices will have the magnification. If you're not able to read it clearly, you can able to expanding the uh, the size of the images. So next, we have to be understand more about the the field of view. So the size of the area which can be viewed through the lens. For example, if you are using a big magnifier, so your field of view will be bigger. And if you are using a small magnifier, then you can see the area of your uh, viewing the particular uh, object, which will be very smaller. So it will be depend upon uh, what type of a lens and uh, what type of a magnifier or telescope you can able to use it in order to see the field of view. If you are using a telescope, your field of view will be very less. Uh, if you are using uh, the magnifier, your field of view will be getting increased. And the lens, if you're having a, a very weaker lens, so weaker lens will be increasing the field of view. And if you're having very stronger lens, the field of view will be getting reduced. So this will be like uh, going uh, oppositely. So if your patient is having a bigger uh, field of view and you can suggest them to go for the, the weaker lens or they just need only the sharper view, then you can go for the, the stronger lens. So we need to be understand the property of this uh, uh, optics and uh, you can able to suggest the devices appropriately for our patients. So we'll see the a lot of uh, basic informations related to the eye and also the optics. Next, we move on to how we can able to apply these uh, models into our uh, practice. So this is an ICF model. So how we can able to implement it for visual impairment. So the health condition is eye diseases. Because of the eye diseases, you can see the body function and structure will be affecting. It will cause some uh, visual functioning problem. Because of that, you will have the limitation in activities and the limitation in activity leads to participation restrictions. So the limitation in the activity is not only because of the eye diseases, sometimes the environmental factors which will also causing a combined effect. For example, if you take the environment will have a lot of uh, uh, barriers for the person and this barrier will be adding on for the uh, limitations apart from the uh, structural deficit in the eye. So we need to be considered about the environmental factor also. And some of the personal factor will also having an effect on the persons. So these are the low vision rehabilitation team members. So the, uh, the top you'll have the physician who having ophthalmologist or optometrist, and uh, we have occupational therapist. And uh, uh, because occupational therapist will be dealing more about the environmental modification and daily life activities uh, treatment. So that's why it comes under the second. And physical therapist can also help the person with uh, low vision in order to improving the, the physical ability of the person. For example, the person having a weak muscles, uh, having difficulty in holding the magnifier. So they can work on improving the, the muscle power to sustaining the endurance level of the patient in uh, holding the devices when do the uh, ADL activities. And the psychiatrist and psychologist also having a greater role because uh, when you're having a normal vision, you don't have any problem. Suddenly your vision is lost, so you will be entered into the uh, psychological issues like you will get more depressed and uh, your self-esteem and self-confidence will be getting affected. So during that time, your mental health ability is getting affected. So the psychologist can able to help you to give more counseling to overcome of your uh, psychosocial issues. And sometimes a nurse who are having a, a specified certification in the diabetic they can also suggest some kind of a uh, uh, suggestion for the optic devices. So vocational rehabilitation teacher and occupation therapist can be worked together in order to bring in the uh, optimum level for the functional ability of the person. And uh, next is the orientation and mobility specialist because of the low vision, uh, the orientation to the environment and your mobility pattern is going to be changed because you're going to be walked with the canes uh, and your mobility has to be changed. So this type of a specialist will be giving the, the training for the person. And uh, 
there may be a difficulty whether uh, we having the specialist uh, especially in india i don't know we having the specialist on this uh, mobility and orientation because most of the time mobility will be uh, targeted about the physical therapist and functional mobility will be targeting about the occupational therapist we will be working on that one our next is the social worker will have a tremendous role in order to bringing about the different kinds of resources which can be helping for the people who are having the visual uh, uh, problems and uh, next is the adaptive technology specialist has been working along with the occupational therapist because occupation therapist will be working more on the assistive technology devices so we can work together in order to bring the appropriate uh, technological devices which can be able to help for the patients so all this one we not having like a separate role so we must having some kind of an uh, a multidisciplinary approaches in order to uh, dealing about the the patient's problems so that may be sometimes uh, difficult so i just uh, read uh, one articles uh, which has been uh, uh, published in indian journal of an occupation therapist uh, sometimes they will having a difficulty in uh, sharing the informations or uh, sharing knowledges with a uh, different uh, professional so nowadays we will be more concentrating about the interprofessional uh, uh, education is very important and it will be help for the patients uh, to get some good improvement so lot of uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches can be applied uh, when you facilitating the rehabilitation process this is mainly for uh, bringing the outcome of the the patients so as an occupation therapist we have to be work according with our uh, practice framework and whatever the conditions you are dealing you have to be work along with your occupation therapist practice framework it may be a neurological problem or it may be a musculoskeletal problem or it may be a cognitive or mental related uh, health problems or visual uh, rehabilitation is also fall under this and because this is our framework and we have to be work along with that one so for that we have to be understand about our framework so basically it's a very big topic but i cannot able to cover it all the informations about otpf here but i just try to introduce something like the divisions uh, in otpf we have a domains and the process domain is the area where we have to be uh, working on our patient and the process is the way how we are going to be dealing with our patient so if you see the the domains there are many uh, main main important five domains are there in that the occupation which is going to be the core area for an occupation therapist where we can going to be deal more about activities of daily living instrumental activities and work play and leisure and social participation is having the main important role apart from that we have other domains like client factor performance skills performance pattern and uh, and we can also see the contacts which having a very good uh, important role so any one of the domain is getting affected it will having the effect in all this one for example uh, body structure eye is getting affected definitely the person will having a problem with performance pattern and also in the occupations and the environment will be just adding the uh, consecutive problems related to the the client factors that's why you can see here all the domains which having some dynamic kind of an interrelationship in order to bringing the occupational performance level of the patients so we need to be understand about how we are dealing with this domain so this is just an uh, example how the visual impairment will be fitting according to our domains so in client factor especially we seeing more about body structure and body function so body structure i will getting affected and body function the vision impairment will be getting affected so because of this thing our performance skill like a uh, reading skill and writing skill will be affected sometimes the performance level and the demands of doing that particular activity will be getting increased due to the visual impairment when you are normal uh, vision you don't have any problem in reading and writing when you enter into the low vision so it will be affecting your reading writing so the demands which will be like uh, physical demands or uh, social demands or environmental demands space demands you need like more lightning and you need to be changing lot of things in the environment so it will be affecting the the performance skill of the patient and your habits next is the performance pattern especially your roles and habits also getting affected so as a role as a student will be getting affected because of your poor reading and writing skill or your work will be getting affected because of your low visions and sometimes your habits will also be changing 
uh, due to the visual impairment. Before uh, normal vision, you can walk normally without any of uh, assistive devices. But after the low vision, you have to be use a canes or you can use uh, any of the assistive devices, and it will be become a habit for you. So totally, your roles and habits also be getting changed when you enter into the uh, visual impairment. So next is the occupation. Occupation will having a lot of challenges to participate in the ADL and IADL activities due to the visual impairment. And you will also enter into the psychological problem. So the psychological problem will be getting affect the sleep. When you are in depressed and the depression will be affecting the sleep. So the sleep will be affecting your day-to-day uh, -day daily activities. So it all will be interconnected. And the environmental dominal will be adding additional challenges to the uh, person with visual impairment to participate and engaging in the, the particular environment due to the visual problems. So if you understand how to implement the, the problem into our uh, domains, and it is easy for you to do the uh, analysis of uh, all these domains, and you can able to identify the problem and easy for you to setting the goals. So how you can able to rationalize the, the OT can be able to work in the uh, low vision rehabilitation because OT will have a lot of role in the geriatric population or elderly populations. So when you are concerning with the elderly population, especially you're talking about the dementia or you can talking about the balance problems and the false problems, all this problem has been interrelated with the, the low vision because low vision is one of the age related factors. So when we are working in a, a geriatric population, so the low vision is also having a, the role in that one. So it may be a rationally for why uh, OT has to be involved in the low vision rehabilitations. And OT will be working in a lot of uh, chronic conditions uh, like uh, uh, diabetic. We also having a role in that one. So a lot of chronic condition will be affecting the vision. So OT will can able to participate in that one. And the availability of an OT services are wide uh, compared to the rehabilitation services. So according to the, the National uh, Institute uh, and also the, the National Institute in India, they will be suggesting that uh, there is a lack of uh, visual rehabilitation services, uh, which can able to reach the, the people who are having uh, visual problems. So OTs can be widely available. So we can able to use the OT services in order to delivering the uh, low vision rehabilitation. And we also having a lot of role in related to the environmental modification, home modifications, and we have to be concerning about the independence in uh, doing uh, aerial activities. So we have a huge amount of a role. So that's why mainly I try to take this topic because uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, few the scope of this uh, low vision rehabilitation has not been fully aware about uh, from the different uh, rehabilitation professional. So it can be an eye opening session for them to include occupational therapy services into the low vision rehabilitations. So some of the common concern we have to be take when you are dealing with the low vision client is just like a general information. So it's like a, uh, just like a manners when you are dealing with the patient. So you have to be announced yourself when you are entering or leaving the room, because otherwise a uh, patient may get uh, frightened if you suddenly uh, uh, go without uh, announcing the, your name or who you are. So they will get uh, frightened and uh, sometimes it will cause some uh, psychological problem for the patient. So try to uh, announce yourself before you enter or leaving the room. And uh, try to give some conversation to the person before you start in uh, activities or ending in activities. And always uh, speak directly to the person in a normal tone of voice. And try to call the person by the name or touch him or uh, lightly on the arm. So before touch him, you have to be uh, asked for the permissions. So require for the permission before you touch. And try to explain what you're going to do before you start your activities. Uh, avoid... Uh, giving some expression like uh, it is uh, over there or over here or right there or right here because it will not give any meaning. So we have to give the appropriate uh, direction in instruction. Suppose you want to ask them to take a cup of coffee, you can just mention that the coffee has been just pre uh, presented in your uh, left side or presented on your right side. So you can just uh, specify the direction so it is easy for them to uh, concentrating on that one. For example, if you're giving a plate of food and uh, you can able to demonstrate in the uh, direction of the clocks. Okay, I will keep the potato on the uh, 
12 o'clock and i will keep the the rice is on the 3 o'clock and i will keep the curry is on the uh, 6 o'clock so we can able to give the direction so the person can able to imagine where the, the object has been available so it is very important to uh, mentioning the specific direction before you giving the instructions suppose if you having doubt how you can going to help your patient you can just ask the uh, client because the ot will be more concerning about the uh, client center practice so you can ask the client how you can able to help them and you can be act according to that one so it will be very easy for the person to following you and do not rearrange the space of the person with the visual impairment because sometimes they will have some uh, memory of the object which has been presented for example the telephone if i walk from my bed at 10 feet from my bed i can able to reach the telephone suppose if you're uh, replacing the telephone without informing them they will walk 10 feet and they cannot able to find the uh, the telephone so it should be very important before rearranging the space you can be informing the person or please don't rearrange the space because they will have some specific type of a memory related to the object which has presented in the environment and try to avoid any kind of an, uh, uh, safety hazards and try to keep the door always open or always close if it is in the staircases please close the door always is and uh, push the chairs which is in the uh, up in different places push the chair inside it. so this is a common concern when you have to be uh, deal with the patients so we see the domains already next we're going to do the evaluation so when you do the evaluation you have to follow the uh, otp of evaluation process so it will having a three types of process one is related to the occupational profile and analysis of occupational performance and next we have to be deal about the intervention plan implementation and review the intervention and finally we have to see about the outcomes measures so we have to have the collaborations this is very very important so your uh, therapeutic relationship has to be maintained uh, uh, very good between the uh, the client and also the the practitioner so the therapeutic relationship is uh, very important because the patient has to be believe that uh, he that you can able to help him in doing certain kind of a task so once they believe that it will be make them to get more motivated in doing the particular activities so we're going to see the the process uh, how to getting an occupation profile and analyzing occupation performance related to the uh, low vision impairment so these are the assessment which can be done related to the optometric and uh, most of the optometrists and ophthalmologists will be uh, able to do or the opticians can able to do the all this kind of an uh, testing which we can be seen before and you can able to get the the report from the optometrist related to all this information uh, it is easy for you to get to communicate with the optometrist or ophthalmologist or opticians to get this information and try to implement that into your uh, treatment practice and if you're having a difficulty in getting information and we are having a special assessment uh, to checking the visual screening we can able to see it here so after the optical evaluation has been done our ot evaluation has been started so our main aim is mainly to determine what is the client's needs and wants because uh, we are the client center practice and we have to be more focused about what is the clients and needs and we have to identify the factors that will act as a barrier for the development of the treatment plan and the specific needs has been need and we have to be interact with the low vision optometrist uh, about the client physical capability and the living environment because uh, the devices going to be suggest only by means of optometrist so we have to be give the clear information about the, the client capabilities, either is physical, uh, cognitive, and other aspects, psychosocial aspect, all this one we have to be discussed with the optometrist and uh, their living conditions. So they can able to suggest appropriate uh, uh, low vision devices uh, for the patient. And after you get the low vision devices, you can able to train the person how to use this uh, uh, low vision devices. So most of the time, uh, people are going for the optometrist and they will get their uh, glasses but sometime after they get the glasses, they will not using it properly in the day-to-day -day daily activities. So it is mandatory. They have to be use it on the daily day-to-day -day activities, but sometimes they have difficult to how to use this uh, optical devices. So in that case, what you can able to teach them how to use the optical devices uh, for the day-to-day -day daily activities. So we have to be in before you evaluate you have to be know about the functional abilities uh, what may be the current goal and how is uh, their participation in all the adl leisure and work activities 
So when you do the evaluation, you please try to concern about the environment. So this is very, very important because uh, most of the time uh, we are not uh, concerning about the, the context when you're giving the treatment for the patient. So we have to be very careful when you're giving the treatment Please think about the context in the, all the aspect, physical context, social context, cultural context, personal and virtual context. So nowadays, uh, due to COVID-19, we will be more related to the virtual context because I am conducting this session is also on the uh, virtual context. So they need to be know how to manipulating the uh, technological devices if they're having it. And uh, we have to be concerned about the cognitive and physical factors because these are our uh, day-to-day -day daily routine activity for an occupation therapist. And sometimes uh, the cognition will also causing the problem. If you take the person with the dementia along with the uh, uh, low vision problems, uh, when you're giving some kind of uh, teaching strategies for this kind of a dementia patient, we need to be think about the cognitive level and we have to be give the instruction according to the cognitive level. And we also think whether the condition is progressive conditions or not. So according to that also, we have to be uh, set our evaluation process. And we have to be see how these optical devices has been used in the occupational performance. If you find the optical devices is not suitable for the occupational performance, and you can able to recommend the, uh, the new devices uh, to the optometrist and ask them to providing the uh, new devices. So how are you going to get the occupation profile? So by means of doing the interview method. So these are the information you need to be collect from the patient. So what is the reason for the seeking these services and how you can able to engage in the daily day-to-day -day activities, whether the day-to-day -day activities is successful or not, what are the barriers are they facing in the occupations, what is their interest and value because based on their interest, you can able to formulating your uh, therapeutic activities and checking the occupational history, performance pattern, and try to check about the environmental barriers and checking the client priorities to desire our target outcomes. So by means of an interview, you can ask these questions. And if you're having any specific related information related to the low vision function, so this is the questionnaire you can able to use to collect the, the information related to the occupational profile. So it is a veteran's uh, affair of low vision uh, visual functioning questionnaire because this has been uh, come from the military because uh, low vision has been first started in the military aspect. So the questionnaire has been come from there. So that's why they mention is a veteran affairs, low vision, uh, visual function questionnaire. So it having 48 questionnaire related to the low function of the patient in related to the occupational performance. And these are all the other uh, standardized assessments you can able to use to getting the information about the occupational performance. Uh, most of you will be very known about this one, Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, where you can able to identify the client priority in day-to-day uh, -day life activities and also their uh, performance and the certifications level. So next, you can also use a revised self-report assessment for the visual functional performance, or you can use the functional visual screening. So this is what I mentioned before. Uh, if you have difficulty in uh, getting the information about uh, visual acuity and uh, visual field problems, you can use this uh, functional vision screening. It's mainly used for the brain injury visual assessment battery, but you can take the some of the component informations which can be assessed from there. So the guideline practice of an uh, American Occupation Therapy Association has been suggesting to use uh, COPM and also the uh, by wipa uh, as a, one of the screening tool for the occupational performance evaluations. Or you can able to use the National Eye Institute Vision uh, Visual Screening Questionnaire uh, for checking the visual ability of the person. Or you can use activity inventory and self-reported falls to getting the history of the falls, how many times they get falls. Uh, based on that, you can able to identify the barriers and you can start to removing the barriers. And we have some independent measure, same like a uh, uh, functional independent measure. We have an independent measure, especially for low vision. It's called as a low vision independent measure. And you can able to find the difficulty in the functional activities of daily living, mainly re related to the vision. For example, in kitchen area, what may be the uh, independency getting affected in the kitchen area due to the low vision. So you can ask some questionnaire related to that one. And it has been developed by Smith in uh, 2019. And we are using the geriatric depression scale because you know the uh, people low vision will go for uh, psychosocial issues. So you can able to measure the, the depression scales. 
and you can also do the assessment of the lightning as i mentioned before in the light modification you have to assess the environment of the lightning so for that we can use this assessment home environment lightning assessment for hela so hela is mainly assessing about the the pre intervention and post intervention that mean pre intervention means how the environment are uh, uh, lightning before you do any kind of a modification after you do the modification how the patient is able to uh, feel the performance and satisfaction level so this is can also be very important information so related to uh, low vision and for home environment you can also use a i hope assessment because i hope assessment is mainly uh, to assessing the home environment for the people who having uh, low visions and also uh, with the geriatric populations and the mn read chart i already mentioned you it is very helpful for uh, do the reading assessment the speed of uh, reading ability of the person so you can able to check with the pre and post assessment and next is the interview and general observation so this is always very common as an occupation therapist you should have a very good clinical observation skills by means of uh, having the clinical observation you can able to detect a lot of problems which can be uh, not identified by the some of the standardized measurement after you identify the issue by your clinical observation and you can able to apply it in your standardized measure so uh, general interview and general clinical observation is very much important in order to identifying the adl and iidl problems so these are all the few standardized assessments so we can able to use it for the uh, low vision rehabilitation in related to the ot perspectives so next is the intervention process so we have to be start with the uh, uh, intervention plan writing the goals of our patients after you writing the goal and uh, selecting the appropriate treatment uh, methods and you can start uh, implementing the intervention and after you give the intervention for a uh, few weeks or few months and you can able to check the review of the intervention whether you will get the appropriate improvement or not if you are not able to get the improvement and you start to review your goals and then uh, re uh, planning your interventions and then start to give the new treatment intervention for the patients and finally you have to be achieving the outcomes so how i'm going to be practicing this low vision rehabilitation so according to the practice guideline given by the american occupation therapist association so they basically mention about the multi component approaches is very very uh, important and it will give the lot of improvement for the patients so as they mention the practice guideline so it is mandatory for us to follow the the practice guideline as usual it is uh, in america but not in india but uh, anyhow we have to be follow uh, what has been practiced uh, in a uh, uh, well known uh, uh, area and you know most of the time we are following the lot of guidelines which has been produced from the american occupation therapy association maybe we can modify according to the indian practice guidelines after we reviewing the the interventional process for our patients so they believe that a multi component approach is the best approaches and it will be including the the following six categories uh, first one is about the education of the eye condition to the patients or the client and then we have to be providing the resources advocacy so what are the availability where the treatment area where the treatment availabilities are there or what may be the reimbursement process where you can able to get the uh, money for uh, buying the assistive devices or where you can go into reimbursement for uh, do the home modification or environmental modifications so this kind of and resources can able to give uh, by the uh, advocacy you know one of the role of uh, ot is just giving the uh, self advocacy so it is one of the treatment approaches and next is the uh, training in the problem solving strategies so this has been included like whenever you do the treatment implementation and you find the patient is facing any problem in uh, doing an activity so we need to be use some strategy there itself and try to uh, solving the problem so you have to give this uh, problem solving strategy until you find the patient does not have any problem in doing the the task so next is the environmental modification and eccentric weaving and the training in using the optical and non optical uh, devices and instruction in doing the adaptive strategies so how you can able to modify the the way of uh, doing the activities in order to facilitate the uh, daily performance activities so in this the first three categories is mainly about the uh, educations and uh, giving the informations and try to solving the problem in the doing activities and other three will uh, is like environmental modification what we are going to be see today and uh, what are the different things we can able to do 
So the first thing in the environmental modification, as we mentioned before, we have to do the, the changes in the lightning and sometimes the low vision will causing the, the glare problem. So we need to do the modification to avoid the, the glares. So how I can able to increase the lightning? By just increasing the watts of the bulb to the maximum allowed level of the fixtures. Maybe in a one room environment, they will be allowed to do only like one fixtures, or maybe you can fixture is like the, the the light which has been presented in the room. Uh, for example, if you have a small uh, area of uh, room and you have only one light and that light will not be sufficient, maybe you can increasing the voltage of the lights. So the, the area will be getting bigger and it will be easy for the person to see the images in the environment. And, and task lighting is very important. When you're doing like uh, reading or uh, writing activity, you can use this uh, goose neck lamp uh, with a solid shade, it can be very good for uh, in increasing the lighting aspect. And uh, placement of the light is also very important, where we have to be placed the right, uh, light. So when you're writing, try to put the light should be opposite of your writing hand, so uh, it will not be producing the, the shadows or gallops, uh, which will be comes from the, the light, which will be affecting the, the field of uh, view. And try to use uh, halogen kind of in bulbs because it will be having a very less glare. And uh, you can also use uh, LED lights. LED lights will be giving uh, more uh, brightness uh, for the patient to able to see the object clearly. And always try to check the light should not able to cause glare. If you're having a glare, try to use some of the adaptive devices to reducing the glare like a visor. You can put the visor or you can put the hat in order to avoid the glare and try to maintain the different types of lightning and try to check which lightning will be uh, very much useful for the patient and try to uh, put the particular light for the patients. So, so we need to do the HeLa assessment, uh, try to identify the uh, lightning issues and try to solve the problems. So these are the different lightning options. I mentioned the goosebumps and you can uh, create a more extra light in the cardboard in order to easily visible the, the object and the colors or you can use the base light in the kitchen in order to identify the objects. And if a patient is having a problem in a reading and a glare when they're reading, you can use this kind of a typoscope, just they can able to see only the area which one they want to read, so it will be avoiding the glaring. Or we can able to give a lot of uh, adaptive devices for writing. You can use this kind of things for writing or you can use this to signing the signature of the check. So you can have the typoscope only for the signature of the uh, check. So the patient can be able to sign the check in the appropriate place. So they cannot be able to misplace it. And you can use this kind of an yellow fixtures. Uh, if you're having any kind of a glare while you are driving or doing any, any activities. So you can use this one. It will be avoiding the glare and it's also magnifying and increasing the, the field of view for the patients. So these are the few uh, examples for the lightning options. Uh, next is the important is the contrast modifications. So this is an example for the few contrast modification you can see in the, the picture. So here you can see the difference between the, the toilet seat in white color and the toilet seat was in a blue color. So they will have a different uh, contrastivity. So it is easy for the person to uh, see the environment. And also you can see the wall with the uh, light color and the bright color. So this is the bathing area and the light color is uh, where the towel has been presented. You can see light wall with the dark green towel. So the patient can able to differentiate between the wall and the towel. So they can able to easily identify it. And some of the, so you can see in this picture, there is no light and there is no indications of the uh, contrast mark in the star cases. So this maybe leads to get uh, falls for the elderly population. Most of the uh, elderly populations will be fall in the star cases. So here you can do the modifications like increasing the light and also you can increasing the edges with uh, the bright coloration strips. So the low vision people can able to easily see it and you can also color the, the rails with the bright color so they can able to identify the, uh, the rails and uh, it will be increasing the safety process for the patients. So there's a few examples for how you can do the modification in the contrast levels. So it's an example for the good contrast and this is an example for the bad contrast. White colored uh, cloth with a white plate difficult for the person to distinguish it, but you can put the black color or matte with the white color plate so the person can able to easily distinguish the sensitive contrast sensitivities. 
and here i'm going to show you the small video related to the different uh, adaptive uh, tools which can be uh, really used by the person who having a, a low vision impairment I'm So 
Okay, so the video will be giving you the some of the information and a few uh, adaptive and assistive tools we can be able to use, and some of the talking devices is also very much helpful for the person uh, in doing their uh, daily day to day activities. So next is the visual uh, field enhancement. How I can able to improving the visual field uh, for the person who having a loss of an uh, visual field. Uh, first one you can see in the right corner of the picture. So you can able to use the the prism lens or uh, this prism will be very good in uh, carrying the informations uh, from the uh, loss of a visual field and bring it to the, the normal visual field area. So especially we can able to use this in the stroke uh, patients who are having the uh, loss of visual field, unable to see the object in the, the neglected area and try to bring the, the object towards the normal vision site. And uh, next is the uh, eccentric training and OT will be having a uh, training uh, given to the person in the ability to uh, reading uh, and materials. So this eccentric training is uh, first uh, mainly people who are having a central uh, uh, vision loss. So people who are having a macular degeneration central vision loss, you can help them to use this eccentric training uh, for reading purpose. So first we have to ask the person to fix the center area and then ask them to see what which area they can able to clearly see the, the images and then try to do the adaptations, make them to read on the, the particular area. So after that, we are going to show some video related to how to facilitating the eccentric training. And next is the, the canes, mainly the canes, they can use it for uh, walking and also for the indications for the others. Maybe in the previous video, you can see how they will be using the cones. Uh, you have to use the scan by moving uh, to right and left in front of you, uh, mainly to identify if you're having any obstacle uh, or barriers uh, in front of you when you're walking. And uh, this will be a great indication for finding the barriers. And another, that's called as a guide cane. And support cane is like uh, uh, not used for uh, walking, but it will be help you to notify others uh, when you are crossing the roads and something like that. So we can able to notify that you are visually uh, impaired. So uh, it's a notification. So others will know and it will be able to help you. And next, you can able to teach the patient uh, by do the, the trialing techniques. Uh, trialing technique is like as a person to uh, test the wall when they're walking, as a person to test the wall with the hand. And then when they're walking, they're just going along with the tracing the wall and they can able to easily identify if they're having any barriers when they are walking. Uh, either they can use the hand for uh, tracing on the wall on the upper level. They can also use the, the cane uh, for using the, finding, identifying the, the barrier in the lower level. So as a person to memorize the, the barriers uh, they are facing whenever they do this kind of uh, trailing techniques. Uh, next is the guiding techniques and the guiding techniques. Uh, one of the guiding techniques is uh, using the dog. So the dog will be as a guide for the visual person, try to identify the obstacle barriers. Once you are uh, very much uh, aware about your pathway, where you want to go, and you can able to use this dog as a guide. Please don't touch the dog until uh, you are you are getting a permission from the, the person. So it may be disturbing them in uh, identifying the, the space. And another guiding technique is like, if you want the person to walking along with you, you can make the person to holding your elbow and make the person one inch behind you. And when you're going forward, make the person to be coming along with you. So this can be one of the great guiding technique for the person. Uh, helping with the visual impairment. Before you help them, you try to ask them because uh, many of the visual impaired person doesn't need any kind of a uh, guiding technique because they will be mostly independent in doing the task. So 
if they really need an uh, support then you can able to give them the support and you can also give the guiding techniques in the seating aspect how to make the person to sit down and stand up so you can able to guide them uh, by your uh, uh, expertise and it will be help them so if you want to know more about the the guiding techniques you can just uh, Uh, do the youtube you can find a lot of videos are available for uh, uh, teaching the different guiding technique for the people with the low vision so this is a way to we can enhancing the uh, visual field so here is a video how to give the eccentric training for the patient So that's a video showing about how you can help the person who having a macular degeneration in order to helping them to the reading abilities. So next is uh, optical devices we call it as magnifiers. We have different types of uh, magnifiers which will can help the person. So the first one is a uh, spectacle magnifier and anhel magnifier. We have two types one is uh, illuminated and it is non illuminated. That is like one is illuminated means uh, with light and the non illuminated is uh, without light. and also we have the stand magnifier and uh, the stand magnifier which uh, uh, can kept along with the spectacles and we have a bar magnifier telescopic magnifier and electronic magnifiers so spectacle magnifier having different types we have off high spectacles tv glasses or sporting spectacles on the lofus so lofus is like a extra attachment uh, can be given along with the the regular uh, glasses and this will be allow you to having a hand free magnification because you're going to be put it on the eye and there is no use of a hand so your hands will be free and you can able to use this uh, for the close activities especially the half eye spectacle and the lupus can either uh, mainly used for uh, identifying the close near visions or sometime you can able to use it for the a uh, distance also so one of the advantages is hand using free and uh, one of the disadvantages like half eye spectacle can only to use the close viewing distance cannot able to see it for the far viewing so you can see the the different types of spectacle magnifier and this is a kind of a lupus which will be more focusing more about your closer viewing so suppose you are not able to see the object very clearly 
So next is the handheld magnifier. So the size will be vary from uh, two times of magnification up to 14 times of magnifications. Uh, maybe you can see the, the magnifying, the size of the lens is going to be become smaller. For example, here we have the uh, big magnifier. So the lens will be very weak. So it will be like, like uh, uh, 14 or 15 times. So the lens will be very weak where you can able to see the uh, bigger uh, field of view, but the, the letters will be like not very sharp. But when you go for the stronger uh, uh, lenses, you can see the size of the magnifier is getting reduced. So this is a weak lens and this will be the stronger lens. The stronger lens will having the smaller one where you can able to see the uh, images exactly very clear, uh, but your field of view will be getting reduced. But here your field of view will be good, but it will not like a more sharp images, you cannot able to see it. And in order to bring back the sharp images, you need to be hold the magnifier at the particular distance. What I mentioned before is the, the focal length. The focal length has to be maintained. So the OT has to be identified what may be the optimal length you can able to see the, the sharp images of the object. So make the person to try to use it on that one. So when you want to use a magnifier, make it first to get it closer to the object and then bring the magnifier closer to your eyes. So in between the object and your eye, you will be keep on moving the magnifier, try to identify where you can able to get the uh, sharp images. So advantages, you can easy to handle it and easy to carry anywhere. And one of the disadvantages, the, the field of view will be very smaller and we need to maintain the distance of reading throughout the paragraph. And you cannot able to do the bilateral activity when you are using this uh, angle magnifier. Next is a stand magnifier. This is a lightweight. And uh, the person has to use the both eye for uh, focusing into the stand magnifier. And one of the advantage here is the focal distance has been maintained. So you don't need to do any kind of an adjustment. Just keep the stand magnifier on the reading area and you can able to read it uh, automatically. And this magnifier is uh, uh, one of the advantages uh, people who are having a uh, tremor or arthritis because uh, if you have uh, arthritis, you cannot able to hold the handheld magnifier for a long time. It will be creating a pain for you because a sustained uh, activity will always creating the pain for the people with arthritis. And if you're having a tremor, you cannot able to hold the handheld uh, magnifier for a long period of time because of the tremor, you cannot able to easily focus. So for this kind of a population, the stand magnifier will be very good because they no need to hold it and they can able to easily view it. And another disadvantage here in the stand magnifier is uh, the working space because the stand magnifier is having a very less working space. If you want to do any of the writing activities, it is very difficult uh, when you are using with the stand magnifier, but the reading can be able to do with this one. Next is the bar magnifier when you are tracing along with uh, reading a book. So the bar magnifier will be very helpful. And uh, telescopic magnifier. So when you cannot able to magnifying the images or uh, you cannot able to go up to the maximum level of the magnification of the lens, you can able to use this uh, telescopic magnifier. Uh, for example, if you are watching the uh, match, uh, the cricket match or anything, you cannot able to expand the Dhoni to become bigger, right? So you can use a, a telescope. By means of telescope, you can bring the Dhoni nearer to your vision and you can able to uh, see him. So that is maybe the help of the, the telescope. There are different types. We have a, a binocular and we have a monocular telescopes. And also we having the uh, wall, uh, the mirror mounted telescope or getting along with the, uh, the glasses you are using. Next is the electronic magnifier. So there are a lot of electronic magnifiers like uh, CCTV or the TV monitor you can able to use it. And this type of magnifier is best for the people who are having a very poor vision. Okay, like not like a mild or moderate, maybe go with like a uh, severe uh, categories. So you can able to go with the electronic magnifiers. Nowadays we have this iPad and iPhone will also having this kind of an, uh, magnifier. And iPhone is also giving the application of the talking tools. So just uh, uh, so the iPhone near to the object, it will be uh, spell what is that object. It is Coca-Cola or whatever the object it may be, you can able to spell it. So it's easy for the person to use this type of talking devices also. This all will become under the electronics. So. You can see the advantage of the electronic magnifier. It can able to enlarge the, the amount of view 
just by keeping the images under the the scanner disadvantage is like the prices so you can see the images here in the at the right side you can just keep the the reading material under the light and it will be focusing on the the screen and you can able to magnify it and also you can able to change the uh, contrastivity of the the images so this is an held electronic magnifiers so what we seen before is like optical devices and these are the some of the non optical assistive devices uh, mainly to using for writing and communications especially you can uh, use uh, writing guides like a typoscope can be used for the writing guides and signature guides and the letter guides or you can use the board like paper so to differentiate between one line to another line you can use an enlarged print papers and you can use a reading stand if you are not able to hold the paper with you and you can able to increasing the numbers in the telephone for the person to having the the greater visions and also you can create the contrastivity in the telephone if the person want to show the differentiate between the number and also the, the telephone one or you can add the video calling or audio calling with the telephones or you can using the felt tip pen which will having a very thick ink so the person when they start to writing they can able to easily see this kind of an uh, images so you can use this uh, felt tip pen is also one of the assistive devices so in the kitchen area we already see uh, this one uh, for a level uh, indicator uh, monitor this one can especially use it for the hot hot material hot water or hot milk or something like that if you want to pour the the cold one you can able to use your finger to measuring the level also and you can see the the low vision uh, black and white cutting board you can keep the vegetable on the white part so the patient can able to differentiate the the color of the carrot and also the background of the white because of the high contrast sensitivity or they can able to using the the measured uh, the spoon for a uh, one tea tablespoon or half it already designed so it can they can able to use this one and this uh, these are the few uh, example for the kitchen assistive devices like a talking kitchen scale uh, boil alert scales or long oven mittens and large print recipes because uh, most of the recipes which come with the uh, smaller uh, letters so you can able to print a bigger one easy for the person to know about the recipes and they can start cooking the the meal and for the health management and uh, we can use the personal scare uh, one you can use the the film monitor with the bigger uh, size uh, name and you can also use the the cutting pillar cutter with the magnifier and the nail cutter with the magnifier so easy for the person to uh, maintaining their personal care and independence and these are all the uh, few uh, assistive devices you can use it for the personal care uh, like uh, sock holders or a uh, tuser magnifier double sided uh, uh, markup mirror item locators just like a talking tools and iron safety guides and talking scale or needle threader can help to use it for the laser activities uh, we can bring the big uh, printer sizes for the cards playing cards you can increasing the size for bingo playing you can also increasing the numbers or you can using the large remote in order to identifying or changing the channel when they watching the tv or if the having a difficulty in holding the card they can use the playing uh, card holders and few the labels and identifiers you can using the the bumps like this in order to identifying or notifying this is the end and you need to change the directions or something like that you can able to use this bumps one or you can use the lock dots especially used in the computer to monitoring the the common used letters or you can use the buttons for labeling in the remote so maybe the password of the uh, the object which you want to open or you can start and on and off buttons you can able to do indicators or you can do the labeling of the daily regular materials like uh, the oil or powder or anything you can able to differentiate uh, for shampoo maybe you can uh, write in a big letter of a shampoo and you put one uh, uh, elastic band and for the oil you can put a uh, two elastic band and perfume you can put like a three elastic bands so just as a marking indicator by means of locating the the bands they can able to identify so this is a shampoo this is a oil and this is the spray or something like that they can able to differentiate so we have to be give the appropriate labeling for the appropriate materials 
So that's all about the assistive devices you can able to use. And we will be following all the, the practice guidelines which has been mentioned in the American Occupational Therapist Association. Next, we move on to the evidence base. So what are the activities uh, we are seeing before? It all having a very good, strong evidence based intervention. So it has been mentioned in the systematic review. You know, systematic review is one of the uh, first level of an evidence based one. So this systematic review is mentioning when you are using the multi-component approach for the low vision rehabilitation, they will have a very good improvement on the ADL and IADL activities. And it will be increasing the reading, occupation performance, leisure and social participations. And when you are uh, training the person with the eccentric weaving, it is also having a very good evidence base because it will be improving the steady eye techniques and it also enhancing the uh, reading ability of the person. When you are using the problem solving strategies, it will help the patient to improve the ADL and IADL activities. When you are using the technology, the vision specific technology, it will be enhancing the reading performance and the visual skill training, especially when you're doing the modifications in the home and the environment, and you will train the person in this particular home and environment. Uh, it will be giving the very good improvement for the person with hemianospia to improving the reading skill and also the targeting the environment. So, all the activities which has been discussed before will having a strong evidence base. So as an OT, uh, whenever you deliver your intervention, you have to be use evidence based practice. So when you are involved in the low vision rehabilitations, you can able to use these activities because these activities are having a very good evidence based uh, uh, scientific uh, related evidences. So these are the few uh, scientific related evidence based articles which I have been found. So when you are using a OT intervention, there will be improvement in the ADL activities for the people with the low vision. And when I am using OT intervention, the leisure and social participation is also getting improved. So it is also the systematic review. And uh, there is an improvement uh, in the reading performance of the person with older when I am using occupational therapy interventions. And there will be a lot of evidences when we're using an OT as an intervention for the low vision people. And uh, there is effectiveness in occupation therapy intervention for uh, people living with uh, low visions. And you can see the improvements of daily activities. Even the driving and community mobility is also getting improved by means of OT interventions. And the leisure and social participation is also getting improved in those interventions. So OT intervention is very good for the person with the low vision rehabilitations uh, when they want to improve in the, all the aspect of uh, occupations. And most of all this research has been I identified from the American Journal of an Occupation Therapy. Uh, I will find rarely the one article which has been just published in an Indian Journal of Occupation Therapy uh, related to the, the low vision impairment. Uh, they study the correlation between the laser interest and uh, visual function by uh, Dr. Khanna and uh, Aikat. So, they are finding the laser interest uh, for the people who are having a low vision uh, by using the, uh, the NEI uh, visual function uh, questionnaire. And they find that the people who are having a complete vision loss, uh, they are having a less interest uh, in doing the laser activities. And any of this result is not generalized because of the less amount of the population they use. And this shows that in India also we are concerning as an OT in using the uh, visual rehabilitation process. But it has been published in 2015. And uh, of uh, five years, still five years, I didn't find any kind of uh, other uh, intervention has been used in this particular area. Maybe my search will be limited. Maybe they can publish it in a few other uh, articles or journals or they have different database. Or sometimes they'll do the researches. This is one of the major problems. We, we, as a student, uh, when you're doing your bachelor's or master's, you do a lot of researches, but these researches are not able to publish. So when you're not able to publish, it is very difficult to uh, say to the the populations that we are working in this particular area and we have uh, different kinds of an evidences. So it is uh, very important for us. We have to do the research and we have to publish that research. It will be reaching the populations, people, and also the other professionals to try to know about it one. So it will be clearly says that there will be a lack of uh, awareness. 
so i think this presentation may be give bring some kind of an eye opening for the budding therapist where we can able to increasing our scope of an practice and i find in some uh, recent article written by dr k mani uh, when they doing uh, research uh, among the awareness of an uh, occupational therapist among the physician especially in uh, trichy area in tamil nadu they find that uh, most of the physician uh, having lack of awareness related to the uh, practicing of uh, occupational uh, therapy so it is uh, very important for us to bringing the uh, awareness about the occupational therapy uh, practices in the physician aspect and also in the uh, public uh, uh populations also so that is the one of the important things uh, mainly i need to convey through this uh, presentations and these are all my references and uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience in uh, uh, hearing this uh, presentation i hope i just giving some kind of justifications related to my topic i hope the students can able to get some informations and uh, therapists it may be having some kind of an uh, uh, reinforcement or like revising the the things so thank you one and all for your kind participations so with that i will end my uh, sessions and I open up for uh, questions if you have any questions related to this topic uh, please uh, go through it thank you mm -hmm. thank you so much sir uh, there are questions uh, that was sent during the session so it is on the chat box so do you want me to read it out or will you be reading it uh, i cannot see the chat here so can okay. you just uh, read it uh, okay so we also have a time limitation so whatever is coming first let me read it mm. in Okay, sorry. How would we assess uneducated patients with low vision? One question. So, it is uneducated or educated is not an issue because you can able to tell in the way uh, how they are going to be uh, understand the things. Okay, so you can just uh, do the problem solving strategies and try to help them. Uh, in understanding how in their own way because we don't have like a specific strategy of written materials uh, given to them so we can just help them to try to understand and keep them practicing more and more keep them practicing more and more it will be help them to uh, use it in their uh, daily day to day life activities okay thank you sir if uh, elder with Visual deficit is living alone in a home. What all environmental modification can an occupational therapist do? More than eight okay. uh, five years. Yeah, mainly you have to do the uh, environmental modification assessment. First, you have to go and assess the environment. Uh, like uh, what I say, like uh, do the lightning assessment and uh, assessing the areas where the barriers they are facing. Uh, maybe sometimes they have a lot of obstacles. and uh, you need to do the home environmental assessment after you do the assessment then you can ask the client to prioritize so which of the barriers we need to be concerned for you more and then you have to try to do the modification in that one especially you can do the lightning modifications and the rearranging the the home materials which will be uh, very feasible for the person to use you can use the contrast sensitivity by changing the color Uh, of the wall or uh, the uh, some indications in the uh, daily uses object for example they want to use the micro oven or they want to use uh, different uh, day to day kitchen activities you can just label the uh, the, the activities for example uh, oil coconut or anything you can uh, try to label it and give some different contrast sensitivity between the floor and the object and make sure the 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 floor should not be like more slippery or not like more glossy if it is more glossy it will be creating lot of glare to the patients so these are all the few modification you can make but it's mainly depend on the individual aspect so you have to go and do the lightning assessment you have to do the home assessment and then you try to identify the problems and try to modify it okay sir another question uh are there any low vision rehab centers in india where occupational therapists are practicing and implementing these techniques 
okay so for this question honestly if i say i'm not aware about this because uh, they have low vision rehabilitation even in the optometrist and ophthalmologist when they are involving in the low vision rehab i know that uh, kendralia uh, visual rehabilitation center they have the low vision rehabilitation mainly they having uh, optometrist and op ophthalmologist and opticians are working in that particular area but uh, i'm not sure whether the ot will be in their area or not uh, but even the ophthalmologist also saying that in one of the article they mentioned that the low vision rehabilitation is having lack of awareness so the main thing is here we need to create the awareness first in order to overcome this issues okay sir uh, what is our ot role in school going children with low vision okay so children because here we are targeting more about the adult population and geriatric population even the children sometimes they will have a profound blindness or sometimes they have a low vision so i was working in the uh, low vision rehabilitation school uh, you know the clark school in mailapur in chennai i was working in the uh, visual rehabilitation center i find uh, the school is having a lot of uh, adaptive and assistive devices are there so they will be teaching a different braille systems uh, uh, for the people to educate and for the low vision they will giving a lot of uh, optical devices so as an ot role when you want to concentrate more about the academics and the learning aspect you can able to prescribe appropriate uh, optical uh, low vision devices and try make the child to be get to use to that one so that is the one of the way we can able to do it okay sir uh, is there any scale or assessment that can be used for children with low vision so already we are uh, we can check the optical assessment uh, for checking the visual acuity and uh, visual field problem of the child and you can also use a visual screening questionnaire uh, and i mentioned in the presentation there is a christopher uh, uh, packet uh, visual acuity charts are there we can able to use that chart for the children assessment apart from that uh, we also using this uh, uh, visual perception assessment the vmi and other things are there for improving the writing and academic skill for the children but most probably i will be concentrating more on the geriatric populations so the assessment what i mentioned here the few assessment can able to use it for example copm can able to use it for the the children some of the visual functional questionnaire can also be checked with the the proxy version instead of asking the children you can asking the parents uh, what are the visual uh, deficit problem your child is facing so based on that you can do some adaptations and modifications for the children even in the the notebook or in the book where they are reading so you can you giving the optical devices for uh, reading for the children okay sir for amd patients with central vision loss what is the best intervention to give visual enhancement techniques like eccentric viewing training to fix peripheral retinal locus or to give electronics aid like portal portable vision enhance enhancement devices okay so as i mentioned before so not all the patient is getting benefited by means of uh, going with this kind of an eccentric training it mainly depends upon uh, each patient so you have to use the eccentric training along with the uh, the devices uh, the optical devices so it will be help them to get more uh, clear informations so we can able to use both together eccentric training plus the optical or electronic devices okay sir what is the intervention for hemispatial neglect so you need to be uh, come to understand the hemispatial neglect is like uh, there is a lack of uh, information carry from the affected environment so as i mentioned before you can using the prism glasses so try to gather the information from the unaffected side bring it to the uh, non affected side and also you can give the the lot of training as an ot we are dealing with the stroke patient you can give a lot of training in order to uh, go to correcting this uh, Uh, neglect problems so neglect means or automatically it will go with the uh, perception problem so that mean you have to be go uh, with the cognitive rehabilitation process for this kind of an issue apart from this uh, low vision rehabilitation so you need to be combined together you can use a prism glass you can give the training and also you can uh, bring all the environmental things which will be 
related to their uh, unaffected sites. Okay. And you can do some uh, uh, contrast changes in the, the dressing, uh, maybe the uh, bright colors, which will also help them to use it. So mainly the spatial thing is like you need to be bring more the, the spatial environment to the unaffected side. OK, role of OTs in amblyoptic kids. So mainly you can do the patching training, uh, try to focus the uh, the lazy eye into the, the functional activities. And uh, if they're having a prolonged visions, then uh, you can able to give the optical devices in order to improving the visual field and also the visual acuity. Mainly, uh, this will having a visual acuity problem. You can go with a lot of an electronic devices if it is not corrected. Uh, one of the best technique is like a patching technique, make the person uh, to uh, focusing on the affected side to be more. Okay, sir. Would uh, you we be using Braille with uh, low vision patients, or is it only used for total blindness? For a severe impaired uh, low vision patients, you can able to use this kind of an uh, Braille system. Uh, that will be also it will be good adding uh, more information for the patient. You can able to use it. Okay. Uh, could you explain a few words about cortical blindness and man management for that? As I mentioned before, uh, we are not seeing the object through our eyes. We are seeing any object through our brain. So when there is a, a total uh, damage to the, the cortical, uh, the visual cortex, so a person will be more prone to get this kind of an, a cortical blindness. So maybe we can try to use it on the uh, unaffected side try to maximizing the information from the unaffected sides for this one because uh, cortical blindness is uh, sometimes difficult to correcting because i mentioned okay. you you need to correct the vision before it affecting the optic nerve so if the optic okay. nerve is getting affected it will lead to perception problems okay thank you sir how do we assess sensory issues in children with low vision Okay, so children with low vision and it is like a question apart from my presentation because my presentation is more related to the adult populations. Yes, but we need to be considering about the sensory issues because you see the uh, when I, because I was working with the visual rehabilitation centers, I can see uh, they will be concerning the sensory issues. Uh, like giving a tactile, uh, proper to and kinesthetic sensation to the children. Along with that, they will also add in the low vision devices uh, uh, for them also. So we need to be addressed both. Okay. So no need to be neglected. Yeah. For treating children under three with sensory issues, can they be exposed to lights against a dark background, which increases the brightness? Uh, sorry, can I can can you repeat? For treating children under three years of age with sensory mm -hmm. issues, can they be exposed to lights against a dark background? I, is it safe to expose them to lights in dark background? I think is what she meant. So, actually, this is uh, not related to the topic. But uh, okay. when you want to give the bright light uh, to the children, we need to be see whether the child is having any uh, uh, visual problem or not. If they are having like uh, high uh, contrastivity to the, the lightning, and this uh, bright light may cause some glare, and uh, it will may cause irritation to the child. So we need to be reducing the glare and try to give the light appropriate to the, the child vision abilities. If the child is having the accommodation properties, uh, there is, I think there's no problem in you giving a bright light because child can able to adapt. If the child is having difficulty to adapt, then we need to be considered about changing the uh, light uh, contrastivity. Okay, sir. I'll ask one more question because of the time constraint. Can you please explain about any driving tools that are available for the person with low vision? Okay, so the driving is an another important area because the driving rehabilitation is a separate area apart from this uh, visual rehabilitations. Uh, we have a lot of uh, simulated tools are there uh, in order to improving the, the driving skill for the patients. And uh, there are special assessment like uh, uh, indoor assessment and outdoor assessments are available for the 
uh, driving rehab. So we need to try uh, train the person in the indoor uh, rehab by means of using a simulations. After the the person is getting a good uh, skill in the simulation one, then we'll be take the patient to do it on the outdoor training. So we can uh, able to do some of the low vision adaptive devices in the in the car, like uh, reducing the glaring and uh, increasing the the contrastivities. So mainly there will be a lot of environmental modification and uh, designing in the car has to be done for the training. But that, that will be another uh, big area. What I given here is like uh, is a drop in the ocean, like a few things about the low vision rehabilitation. But the driving rehabilitation is a separate part. And yes, we have a, a different separate assessment are there for the uh, driving rehab, like a simulation task. And uh, we have, a, we can use a code map as to checking the cognitive ability of the person. And we can use a few of the uh, visual acuity, visual field uh, issues also uh, there in the driving uh, rehab. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, would you like uh, to share your email ID with uh, the participants? If they have further questions, they can uh, contact you. If you are okay with that. Then... Yeah, no problem. You can just uh, share my uh, information. So I'm ready to giving uh, uh, clearing their doubts. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, would anyone like to share your feedback regarding the session in a few words? Afternoon, sir. Uh, myself, Moses. I'm doing my uh, occupation therapy third year in uh, Sri Ramachandra Medical University. First of all, uh, thank you very much for this uh, fantabulous uh, presentation, sir. It was really great. I just don't want to uh, give feedback about the presentation. I just want to talk about uh, how I felt uh, about the presentation. The, really, the professionalism and the standard of the presentation was uh, really very high, sir. It was great. And uh, at the starting, uh, I, I had a uh, love on the two things, the two phases we had, like uh, you just dig into the scientific stuff as well as you had the the um, the, uh, uh, the social things they face in their life day to day life and the uh, factors they which influence the environment that was really great sir like the the currency colors like uh, light modulation that was really great sir afterwards sir, I just talked about the AMD that was that was so nice and the, the important topic which I felt is like the diabetic retinopathy which uh, the the old people commonly face that was really great sir and the glaucoma that was uh, seriously nice. And then you just uh, told us uh, told us about the common concern that we should have on the uh, the environment. So it was really nice, sir. Uh, it uh, on the total, I would say that it is a, a pack of uh, informative session that was really nice. Uh, we look into more the presentation from you, sir. Thank you much. Thank you, thank you, Moses, for your feedback. Uh, thank you, Moses. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Mitra. So uh, I, from Sriar. I'm really eagerly waiting for your webinar, sir. Thank you for your uh, clear view on low vision rehabilitation perspective, sir, which I had not known. And it was a very informative and had gained a lot of knowledge about that, which I can uh, make into it my practice. So it's an excellent presentation, sir. Thank you. And I would also like to thank our HOD, Dr. Raghuram, sir, and our faculties who provided this wonderful opportunity for us, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Mitra. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mitra. So by this, we have come to the end of our webinar. This was the fourth webinar that was organized by the Occupational Therapy Department of Sri Ramachandra in association with Tamil Nadu branch of IOTA. And sir, I must say there are uh, uh, post, uh, there are messages uh, saying thank you from so many people in the chat section. I uh, wish you could see it later. So I would like to formally thank the administration of Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research and Tamil Nadu branch of IOTA for giving us this opportunity. I extend our gratitude towards Dr. Jayachandran for agreeing to speak to us and also for sharing uh, his experiences and knowledge with us. I especially liked, uh, like Moses said, where you mentioned the common concerns with the low vision clients. And it was an eye opener for many of us who didn't, didn't know about much about low vision rehabilitation. 
I also thank all the participants for patiently attending the webinar from various places. Thank you for your cooperation and responses. Thank you for making this session very interactive by asking questions. And a special mention to our HOD, Raghuram sir, and Assistant Professor Sundaration sir, for coordinating and organizing all these seminars and uh, the upcoming sem sem webinars as well. Last but not the least, I thank the staff and students of Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research for their support and cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Raghuram, sir, do you want to say something? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for this uh, detailed session. Uh, you have spent a lot of time with us, though it is a webinar, webinar that what we felt like it is a, what, a direct class. So really, what is a very good session, sir. Uh, definitely will get a lot of feedback uh, from the Indian people. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, providing this opportunity for uh, sharing the information. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you can leave the meeting. So I will get back to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Bye.